Thank you so much, Brad, and good afternoon, or good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's call to discuss the deferred action process as announced by Secretary Napolitano on June 15th of 2012. Today's call will be led by USCIS Director Alejandro Mayorkas, and with that, I will just hand it straight over to you, Al. Uh, thank you very much, Mary, and thanks uh, to all of you for joining us today. Uh, on June 15th, 2012, as uh, uh, all of you know, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, announced that certain people who came to the United States as children and meet several key guidelines may request consideration of deferred action for a period of two years, subject to renewal, and would then be eligible for work authorization. To implement the Secretary's memorandum, USCIS has created a new process for individuals who meet these guidelines to request consideration of deferred action for childhood arrivals. We are extremely pleased and proud to deliver on the Secretary's commitment to implement uh, this process uh, in the 60-day time frame uh, that she announced on June 15th. This afternoon, uh, we are making available online the forms and instructions for individuals who will request deferred action for childhood arrivals. Before I describe the details of the filing process, allow me to provide a brief reminder of the Deferred Action Guidelines. Deferred Action is a discretionary determination to defer removal of an individual as an act of prosecutorial discretion. It does not provide lawful status or pathway to permanent residence or citizenship. Individuals may request consideration of Deferred Action for childhood arrival from USCIS if they, one, were under the age of 31 as of June 15, 2012. Two, came to the United States before reaching their 16th birthday. Three, have continuously resided in the United States since June 15, 2007, up to the present time. Four, were physically present in the United States on June 15, 2012, and at the time of making the request for consideration of deferred action with USCIS. Five, entered without inspection before June 15, 2012, or their lawful immigration status expired as of that date. Six, are currently in school, have graduated or obtained a certificate of completion from high school, have obtained a general education development or GED certificate, or are an honorably discharged veteran of the Coast Guard or Armed Forces of the United States. And seven, have not been convicted of a felony, significant misdemeanor, three or more other misdemeanors, uh, and do not otherwise pose a threat to national security or public safety. Let me uh, now um, share some details with you about the filing process. Beginning tomorrow, August 15, 2012, individuals will be able to submit Form I-821-D, uh, that's D as in deferred, uh, consideration of deferred action for childhood arrivals to USCIS. This form must be accompanied by a Form I-765 application for employment authorization and the accompanying Form I-765WS, which is the I-765 worksheet, establishing an individual's economic need for employment. The total fee is $465, which includes a biometric check and issuance of a secure work authorization document. The forms and instructions are available as of this afternoon on our website, the USCIS website, which is www.uscis.gov slash childhood arrivals. The form instructions provide more detail on required documentation to support a request and provide mailing addresses to file requests with a USCIS lockbox facility. After forms have been received, uh, we, uh, USCIS will review them for completeness, including submission of the required fee. Once the request is accepted as complete, we will send a receipt notice uh, to the individual making the request. We will then uh, send an appointment notice for the individual to visit an application support center, commonly known as an ASC, for biometric services. Individuals will be given sufficient advance notice of their appointment date, which can be rescheduled if necessary. 
failure, though, to attend the biometric services appointment may delay processing, processing of, of a request or may result in a denial of the request. Each request for consideration of deferred action for childhood arrivals will be reviewed on an individual case-by-case -case basis following an, an examination for potential fraud and the completion of a thorough background check. If there is insufficient evidence, I'm sorry, if there is insufficient evidence submitted, we will request more information or schedule the individual for an interview at a USCIS office. Individuals will, will receive a decision on the request in writing and if granted, will receive separately an employment authorization document. While individual processing times may vary, typically individual requests take several months to process. We expect similar processing times for deferred action requests. Although the processing may take several months to complete though, individuals will be able to check their status, the status of their requests online at www.uscis.gov. Today, we are also issuing additional guidance about the educational guidance. Let me, if I can, summarize uh, some of the key guidelines. To be considered currently in school under the guidelines, a requester must be enrolled in a public or private elementary school, junior high or middle school, high school or secondary school, or an education, literacy, or a career training program, including vocational training, that is designed to lead to placement in post-secondary education, job training, or employment, and where the requester is working towards such placement, or an education program assisting students either in obtaining a regular high school diploma or its recognized equivalent under state law, including a certificate of completion, certificate of attendance or alternate award, or in passing a GED exam or other equivalent state authorized exam. Such education, literacy, or career training programs include, but are not limited to, programs funded in whole or in part by federal or state grants. Programs funded by other sources may qualify if they are administered by providers of demonstrated effectiveness such as institutions of higher education, including community colleges and certain community-based organizations. In assessing whether such an education, literacy, or career training program not funded in whole or in part by federal or state grants is of demonstrated effectiveness, USCIS will consider the duration of the program's existence, the program's track record in assisting students in obtaining a regular high school diploma or its recognized equivalent, in passing a GED or other state authorized exam, or in placing students in post-secondary education, job training, or employment, and other indicators of the program's overall quality. For individuals seeking to demonstrate that they are currently in school through en enrollment in such a program, the burden is on the requester to show the program's demonstrated effectiveness. Individuals who are in school at the time of the request and later seek a renewal of deferred action uh, must show at the time of the request for re renewal that they have made substantial, measurable progress toward graduating from school or that they have passed the GED or other equivalent state authorized exam. Circumstantial evidence will not be accepted to demonstrate educational attainment. Individuals must submit direct documentary evidence to satisfy that they meet the education guidelines. Additional details on the current in school guideline are available as frequently asked questions or FAQs on our website. And again, that website is www.uscis.gov slash childhood arrivals. Allow me if I can um, uh, to uh, provide some additional information about disclosure, disclosure and referrals. In addition to the previous information sharing policy to protect information submitted with an individual's request for deferred action under this process generally, 
if a case is referred to ICE for purposes of immigration enforcement or a request or receives a notice to appear at NTA from USCIS, USCIS will not share with ICE information related to the requester's family members or guardians contained in the request for purposes of immigration enforcement against those family members or guardians. However, that information may be shared with national security and law enforcement agencies, including ICE and CDP, for purposes other than removal, including for assistance in the consideration of deferred action for childhood arrivals, to identify or prevent fraudulent claims for national security purposes or for the investigation or prosecution of a criminal offense. Once again, we now have available, or we will have shortly, on our website, more detail on the information I outlined. In addition, we have made available uh, or will shortly the forms required for uh, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals process and the form instructions, which detail filing procedures and documentary evidence requirements. You can find uh, this information, again, on our website at www.uscif.gov slash childhood arrivals. I am joined uh, uh, this afternoon uh, by uh, uh, John Sandwick and Seth Grossman of the Department of Homeland Security, and together we would be uh, pleased uh, to field some questions. Operator? If you have a question at this time, please press star, then one on your phone keypad. If at any time your question has been answered, you may remove your request by pressing star 2. Once again, Please press star one if you have a question at this time. And Brad, before you take the first call, I just wanted to ask uh, for those who, who do have questions, if we could limit those questions to just one per inquirer, just given the number of people who are on today's call. Thank you. Our first question will come from Julie Dinnerstein. Your line is open. Uh, hi, this is Julie Dinnerstein from Sanctuary Families. Thank you for taking the call. And I'm going to repeat a question I asked last week, um, which Director Mayorkas was not able to answer, and I don't know if there's now a definitive answer. Um, I have, for people who made requests between the period of June 15th and August 15th tomorrow for deferred action, either through the uh, public advocate hotline of ICE for people in removal proceedings or through uh, the Office of Chief, Chief Counsel, and got an, an initial affirmative answer that deferred action was going to be granted. If it has not been granted as of August 16th, though the process was initiated through ICE, so one in proceedings, does one just forget the process that was previously initiated and starting tomorrow, August 15th, mail these documents in, or is there something else? You know, again, I think if the Office of Chief Counsel at ICE has or, or indicated that the individual, those are, those are separate process, I guess I would say. If not, I don't know the communication between the Office of Counsel and the Office of Public Advocate. They've indicated they're going to um, defer action on an individual case. You may want to wait and see if they defer action. Of course, any individual who is currently in proceedings or has already been ordered removed may request a review of their case through the USCIS, regardless of whether they're uh, currently in or already subject to a final order for removal. And I would, I would refer to that. Uh, you should refer your inquiry, as, as John mentioned, to the Office of Public Advocate. And I'm assuming you have that hotline then. And have not gotten an answer, but thank you for trying to respond here. Our next question will come from David North. Your line is open. Um, good afternoon. Um, Director, I want to ask a question I asked before of your 1-800 number and got sort of a mixture of responses. The question is this. Uh, given the fact that this program was initially uh, discussed as family bringing in children under the age of 16. Um, my question is, what if somebody comes in at the age, came in at the age of 14 or 15 on their own, which is, does happen, are they also covered by um, uh, this program? Uh, if the individual uh, meets the guidelines uh, for the exercise of discretion, uh, then uh, they will be considered for uh, deferred action for childhood arrivals, whether or not they were accompanied uh, by family members. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from Elizabeth Marar. Your line is open. 
Hi, I'm, my question is, uh, what about previous immigration violations? So whether someone has previously been in removal or has entered EWI multiple times or has a, um, a, a false claim to U.S. citizenship, uh, those kinds of things in their past, is that um, something that needs to, that would necessarily knock them out of the running or would be part of the discretionary considerations or, or how is that treated? You um, I appreciate the question. You've mentioned a, a number of different uh, things, um, repeated um, uh, entries uh, to the United States, uh, potentially a false claim uh, of citizenship and the like. Um, uh, this underscores a very important point that the exercise uh, of prosecutorial discretion is an individualized one, one that is conducted on a case-by-case -case basis, and it depends on the facts uh, of the particular case. And what we uh, would do is we would uh, review uh, the facts of the case uh, under a totality of circumstances, uh, uh, through a totality of circumstances lens, uh, assuming that the individual uh, meets uh, the guidelines for the exercise of prosecutorial discretion, we would consider uh, the facts, the additional facts of the case uh, through that lens. So thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from Wayne Taxer. Your line is open. Thank you. Uh, one of the particular issues that we've had has been regarding CBP. Uh, at the first conference, uh, CBP spoke, and, and with regard to encounters they will have, said that their policy would be to detain, to complete an investigation, and then release. In the past, they have made it very clear that the only way they release them is with an NTA. Uh, and they have said that the June 16th memo uh, that dealt with ICE and press and discretion uh, did not apply to them because it was an ICE-only memo. This, they've taken a rather harsh stand on many of these things. And the question is, for it, uh, for encounters by ICE and others, will they be following the CBP process, or will they be uh, consistent with the ICE and DHS memos with regards to how they will uh, take in, determine, and release uh, people? Uh, can you give some guidance with regard to how they will be handling those kind of things, what we can tell our clients to expect, especially where CPB handles uh, all the detainers at the local jails and have told us repeatedly, we have never lifted a detainer in our life. Uh, this kind of attitude seems to be contrary to what the DHS goals have been. Can you address this, please? Sure, and I appreciate, I appreciate the question. I'll point you to the Secretary's memorandum um, in which she directed CPB effective immediately and died, that, that individuals who meet the guidelines set forth in her memorandum, should not be um, arrested and, and removed from the United States um, for immigration enforcement um, violations. Um, so, let me kind of clarify what I think the Commissioner Customs said on the first call of this, that what CBP is doing is that they encounter an individual um, who appears to meet the Secretary's guidelines. They are running a background check on the individual, detaining them only as long as necessary to ensure that they do not have a criminal history which would actually disqualify them under the Secretary's guidelines. They are then releasing those individuals with a, a notice informing them that they need to go to USCIS and request a review of their case on August 15th or after August 15th. Those individuals are not being served with an NTA. And although I understand CBP may have historically noted that the ICE priority memo does not apply to them, which, which is true, uh, the Secretary's memorandum very clearly did apply to them, and, and based on our conversations with CBP as well as our monitoring of, of their operations, uh, they are very much carrying out and executing on, on her memos that relates to individuals who may be eligible under this process. Thank you. We'll look forward to seeing if that actually is true or if CBP continues to be an independently owned and operated organization. Thank you very right, much. So again, I mean, listen, if you have any problems with CBP, please feel free to ring the bell. And again, I would point you to the Secretary's memorandum, and you might want to point that out to any officers who suggest otherwise. It's very clear on this point. Thank you. Our next question will come from Rigoberto Delgado. Your line is open. Uh, I really don't have a question. Can you hear me? I guess, uh, yes, we can. Well, thank you very much for participating in the call. I sure appreciate it. I'm learning a lot and taking notes on it. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Our next question will come from Phil Galvez. Your line is open. 
Hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much for this opportunity. My question is basically that. What about if I have 11 years old and I'm going to have the opportunity to file in the, the, this program in the future? Because right now I am not qualified. Probably I qualify because I come to the U.S. before they reach the age of 16, but I have no the age ready to apply. But can I do in the future? Uh, yes, you, yeah, I appreciate the question. Yes, you may if you meet the guidelines. And once you um, are at the age of 15, uh, you will be able to request deferred action for childhood arrival. Uh, there is no deadline uh, on this process. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the answer. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you. Our next question will come from Lisa Fisher. Your line is open. Ms. Fisher, please check the mute button on your phone. Our next question will come from Juan Blanco. Your line is open. I thank you very much for taking the call. Uh, for people who have uh, uh, final orders of removal, is there going to be a, a, a motion to reopen process, or can they just file directly with CIS, and CIS will then decide whether or not to um, entertain those applications? Yeah, what I would recommend, and again, is that individuals who are subject to a final order first request at USCIS, if they, if they then um, are, their, the action is deferred on their case, they should then reach out to, to the ICE Office of Chief Counsel to seek a, uh, anything, inappropriate, anything appropriate, including a motion to reopen. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question will come from Baruta Foratan. Your line is open. Hello, oh, thank you so much for taking my call. My question has to do with criminal conviction limitations for deferred action. Um, and it has to do with expunged convictions. It sounds from a memo that was posted on August 3rd that should a person have a felony conviction or major misdemeanor, such as domestic violence or DUI convictions, um, if they get the records expunged, it is still possible, not, not necessarily probable, but possible to obtain deferred action depending on that specific case's um, facts. Is that true? Yes, yeah, so uh, we have additional information, as I alluded to uh, in my opening remarks. But we have and will have uh, information on this subject available this afternoon and are frequently asked questions. Expunged convictions are treated on a case-by-case -case basis. We'll review um, uh, uh, the facts uh, of, of, the, uh, of the conviction on an individualized basis. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next question will come from Sylvia Miller. Your line is open. I was wondering if a, um, if programs that are prerequisite for like a GED program that are, for instance, ESL program in a community college, it sounds like you've got a pretty even drop, um, broad interpretation of in school, but will that include prerequisites to a GED program such as an ESL or other program? So if the program is one that's designed to lead to placement in post-secondary education, uh, job training, or employment, uh, then yes, it could qualify as being currently in school. If it's a standalone program that is not designed to lead to placement in such a program, then it would not qualify, although as with all aspects of the program, things will be handled on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, and the burden will be on the requester uh, to show that the program uh, they're involved in is one that is designed to lead to placement for those programs. Uh, and is uh, one that is of best trade effectiveness. Thank you. Our next question will come from Frederick Schwartz. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Thank you for your continued efforts to keep stakeholders informed. Uh, the Secretary, in her on page three of her memorandum, said the USCIS process shall also be available to individuals subject to final orders of removal regardless of their age. So what did you mean? Um, what um, you'll see uh, in the guidelines that uh, one uh, may request deferred action if uh, one is 15 years of age, uh, between the, uh, um, one is 15 years of age. That 15 year age um, minimum uh, requirement does not apply to an individual in removal proceedings or with a final order of removal. That's, that's what that refers to. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Anthony Giudice. Your line is open. Good 
afternoon. My question's been answered, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from Tashani Logan. Your line's open. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, basically, my question is, um, I recently graduated in 2010. However, they're still holding like transcripts and my diploma because of obligations. I'm, I'm However, sorry, it, no. pardon me for interrupting. I apologize. It's very difficult to um, understand you. The phone line doesn't. Your phone line doesn't seem to be clear. Um, can you hear me now? Uh, yes. I'll Please, uh, sorry, repeat the question. I'll see both. No problem. Um, usually in high school, like if you have obligations, you're unable to get your hands on your um, transcripts in your high school diploma. My question is, in the state of Florida, I don't know about any other state, but you're able to see like your previous school records online and print them. Would that suffice for like school records showing that you've been in school in the United States from whatever age until graduation? What, what we have done in the, um, in the frequently asked uh, questions, additional frequently asked questions that uh, will be available this afternoon is uh, provide uh, further guidance as to the documentation uh, that, um, that we, will, uh, uh, we will review uh, when considering the request for deferred action. I would uh, direct you to those frequently asked questions as well as the instructions to the forms that will be available today. And I think there you will have sufficient guidance. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Asiel Valentin. Your line is open. Historically, CIS has not treated juvenile adjudications as convictions for immigration purposes. Is that uh, going to continue to be the case in the case of um, people who are applying for deferred action who are still minors? Or, uh, uh, I mean, are we going to be looking at it where we're going to be looking at the criminal uh, adjudications for kids for crimes after they were adults? Or we, we just have a lot of kids who got themselves in trouble in the timely court matters. We will, we will be uh, reviewing um, uh, juvenile delinquency on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Uh, operator, I think we have time for uh, two more questions. Our next question will come from Diana Dorarme. Your line is open. Yes, thank you very much. Um, you had alluded to earlier about using various databases in um, reviewing these applications. Are there any specific gang databases that the service uses? I'm sorry, uh, uh, the, the, the federal that we use federal databases. Let me, if I can, uh, uh, for purposes of those texts, but let me, if I can, uh, amplify my question to the prior, uh, amplify my answer to the prior question. Juvenile delinquency does not necessarily um, uh, uh, mean that an individual's request for deferred action uh, will not be considered. Um, uh, we will review uh, the delinquency uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, uh, we're looking at the issue of public safety uh, when reviewing uh, the delinquency. So thank you for and that. Now, if I may just emphasize um, that a little bit more. Some individuals, you know, we're going to look at the severity of the offense, the sentence imposed, the recency of the conduct. So as you engage with individuals who may have a juvenile delinquency record, those are the types of things I was looking at. Obviously, if someone commits what, if they had been an adult, would be a serious felony offense. They did so within the last year, but it was prosecuted as a juvenile. That might be someone, that, someone who you might caution against um, requesting review of their case. However, if it's minor conduct of, of years gone past and there's been um, no, no recidivism, obviously that's the one for whom it's likely not to impact the individualized determination. Um, but it, again, as I already mentioned, that the goal here is public safety, and that's what we're focused on, identifying individuals. If there's clear indicia that they pose a threat to public safety, they're likely not to you know, have action deferred on their particular case. Uh, operator, one more question. Our final question will come from Open. Open, your line is open. Hi, I was wondering if you're working right now with a legitimate Social Security card, but it does say not valid for employment. So when you went to apply, they didn't really look into it, so you have the job. Will your employer be notified that you shouldn't be working, or will that hinder your case in any way? I would, I would, um, I would direct you to our frequently asked questions and the information that we will be providing uh, in this process um, uh, to address the issue that you've raised. 
um, and, and I appreciate uh, the question. Uh, let me, if I can, um, in, in, in closing, and I appreciate everyone's participation in the call this afternoon, uh, uh, emphasize a few points and also, uh, uh, again, repeat uh, the, uh, our web uh, address is www.uscif.gov slash childhood arrivals. In addition, our National Customer Service Center, our 800 number is 375-5283. We uh, are uh, in a position uh, to begin to um, uh, receive a request for deferred action uh, tomorrow, August 15th, uh, consistent with the Secretary's June 15th commitment uh, that a process will be implemented uh, within 60 days. We have developed a process uh, that is clear, uh, that involves the uh, forms uh, that I mentioned uh, that uh, will uh, include uh, a requester uh, receiving a uh, receipt uh, once the request for deferred action for childhood arrivals uh, has been uh, accepted as complete. The individual will then subsequently receive a, a notice of an appointment at an application support center for a biometric check, uh, the, uh, for, uh, the capture of biometrics, a, ba a background check, will then uh, be conducted uh, and uh, the review of the case uh, uh, will uh, then begin. And this is a process uh, that is not instantaneous, as I'm sure everyone uh, understands and everyone who has gone uh, or dealt with our agency before uh, understands uh, that uh, the review of submissions uh, can take several months and we expect this to be uh, consistent with that. So. Uh, with that, I want to thank everyone again for participating and offer your thank you for facilitating the call. Thank you for your participation on the conference call today. At this time, all parties may